Good evening, and welcome again to another Thursday evening Bible study here at Save to Serve and Prophesy again as we are endeavoring to discover gems of truth in God's holy word. And as I said those words, my mind just went back to Great Controversy, page 522, which says, No church can excel in holiness and godliness except its members are daily seeking for truth as for hid, hidden treasures. That's why we're here this evening, to dig deep into the mine of truth, to gather up these gems that we will need to stand before a holy God without a mediator during the mark of the beast crisis. Before we go any further in our study, let's turn to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, let's take a look at verse number 12. Luke chapter 21, verse number 12. I want you to note these verses. Verse number 12 through verse number 15. Verse 12 through verse 15. You know, God's word tell us, just as it was in the first advent, so it shall be in the last days of this earth's history before the second advent. And as Christ was brought before church and state, all of us will also be brought before church and state. And the Bible says we will have to give a testimony. We must tell why we believe what we believe. And we must not at that point be studying. No, it's now that we must make the necessary, diligent, take that necessary time, diligent study of God's word. You know, we're told in the book, Last Day Events, page 209, where Sister White says, clearly, with no uncertain terms. If God has ever spoken by me, the time will come when we all will be brought before church and state and all of us will have to give the reason of our faith. And then we're told since this will be in these last days, we must not waste any more time. We must be studying the word of God to know why we believe the truth we now advocate. And in Testimonies Volume 5, Page 136, volume 5, 136, we are told when the religion of Christ is held in its most contempt, when his laws are the most despised, then should our zeal be the firmest and our courage the most unflinching, to stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us, to fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few, this will be our test at this time, February 17th, 2019. At this time, we must gather warmth from the coldness of others, courage from their cowardice, and loyalty from their treason. In these Thursday evening studies, we want to make sure we know why we believe the truths that we know advocate. Before we dig deeper into God's word, let's turn to Daniel. Chapter 8 of Daniel, as we begin our study. Chapter 8 of Daniel, and let's bow, let's kneel for a word of prayer at this time. Father in heaven, we're thankful for the prophetic word that we will all have to stand before church and state. And if God ever spoke through that messenger, Ellen White, that day will come. Help us to be ready, not only mentally to be able to quote and to give the doctrinal studies, but be spiritually ready, being converted, sanctified. Bless us now, those of us who are local here, saved to serve international online. Bless us now, we pray. Forgive us of our sins. Give us victory. Is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. In chapter 8 of Daniel, we are told in verse number 14, the foundation of our faith on the 2,000 and 300 days, the Bible says, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. I'm, again, I'm going to encourage you, get your Bibles, get your notepaper, get your writing instruments. We're going to study the Word of God. You know, when I read the statement in early writings, page 6 to 3, where we're told that such subjects as the sanctuary in connection with the 2,300 days, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, 
that these have been perfectly calculated to explain the past Advent movement, to tell what our present position is, to give certainty to the glorious future, that, and also to establish the faith of the doubting, that these were the principal truths God's servants must dwell upon. And that's what we are doing, dwelling upon these four subjects, the sanctuary in connection with the 2300 days, the, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Chapter eight of Daniel. Now we know in verse number 14, we find the 2300 prophetic days. It is intimately connected with the 70 prophetic weeks of chapter 9 of Daniel and verse 24. Let's go there. Chapter 9 and verse 24 of Daniel. And the connecting link, one, the same starting date for the 70 prophetic weeks is the same starting date for the 2300 prophetic days. Look at verse 24. Verse 24 mentions the 70 prophetic weeks. Skip on down to verse 25. Let's find the starting date. Verse 25, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment, the what friends? The underscore commandment. From the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be six to nine prophetic weeks. So a commandment went forth. Question, if you were given the study, the next step you would do, the next step you would take with your Bible study contact is to show them the three kings that gave this commandment for the Jews to return from Babylon, from Medo-Persia, to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem. And those three kings, tell your study contact, those three kings were Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes. Now, hold your place for now. In in the ninth chapter of Daniel, let's turn to Ezra. Ezra chapter 6. The Bible tells us that there are three kings. Hold your place in chapter 9 of Daniel. We want a key word from that scripture to connect with Ezra chapter 6. You must connect this with your Bible study contact. Verse 14. The Bible says, and the elders of the Jews, they build it. They, pro they prosper through the prophesying of Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, the son of Ido. And they built it and finished it according to what? Notice that word. According to the commandment, singular, of the God of Israel and according to the commandment, singular, of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. So we see the word commandment. If you go back now, go with me, hold your place, bring your Bible study contact back to chapter nine of Daniel and verse number 25. Look carefully. In verse 25, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment, singular. So how we see in the sixth chapter of Ezra, it says three kings. Naturally, it should be commandments, plural. doesn't say that. It says commandments, singular. That means these three kings all came together to give one commandment, one decree. As a matter of fact, notice I just substituted the word commandment for the word decree. Look at verse 14 of Ezra chapter 6 in the margin in the marginal reference, it says commandment, and the word commandment means decree. Notice now, go back to verse 14. Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes. Put these dates down. Put these dates down. You have Cyrus. He gave his decree in the year 536 B.C. Put that down. 536 B.C. And then we have Darius. Darius did not give a new decree. Remember, tell your Bible study contact this. Darius did not give a new decree. He simply strengthened. He simply upheld the decree, the commandment Cyrus gave when that commandment, that freedom was challenged by Sanballat, by Tobiah, by Geshem, by the Samaritans who were trying to stop Nehemiah, Ezra, Zerubbabel, 
from building, rebuilding Jerusalem. Again, Darius did not give a new decree. What did he do? He strengthened that first decree. That was what year? 519 BC. Put that down. 519 BC. And then we come to verse number 14. The last king, his name is Artaxerxes. He gave his decree in 457 BC. So pastor, was that last king a new decree? It was not a new decree. The, the words from Art, Artaxerxes was simply expanding upon the decree, the commandment Cyrus gave formally. Put that down. Now notice, so we have uh, Cyrus 536, Darius 519, Artaxerxes 457. Now, hear me carefully. Your, your Bible study contact will ask you, how, how are there three kings? Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, yet you as Seventh-day Adventists, you always use the date of Artaxerxes. Why not Cyrus and Darius? We have to understand this because we are going to stand before church and statesmen. Oh yes, critics, blasphemers, scoffers, we better know what we believe. So we don't use Cyrus 536, we don't use Darius 519, but Artaxerxes. Why? Because that was that decree, that was the decree, that was expensive, and fulfilled the prophecy of chapter 9 of Daniel and verse 25. Get to the screen. Great controversy. Page 326. Now you could read the top part of that. Look at those three kings. Cyrus in blue. Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Next sentence. These three kings. Notice now three steps. In originating. What else? Reaffirming. That's Darius. And completing the decree. That was whom? Artaxerxes. So now, let's go in our Bibles now and see when did Xerxes, when did Artaxerxes complete, give that complete decree from Cyrus. It was in his seventh year as king. Look at chapter 7 of Ezra. Bring your Bible study contact, your Bible study group. Show them it was in the seventh year as king. Go to verse 7. The, the last phrase of verse 7 says, verse 7 of Ezra 7, it says, In the seventh year of Artaxerxes, the king. What did he do in that seventh year? Verse number 11. Verse number 12. Look at verse 13. I make a decree that all they of the people of Israel, and it goes on, that they may return to Jerusalem and rebuild the house of God. Verse 27, the last phrase, verse 27, to beautify the house of the Lord, which is in where? Jerusalem, in the seventh year as king. Then you bring your Bible study contact to this fact. We must now go to history and find the first year of the reign of King Artaxerxes. Then count seven years and it confirms 457 BC. So now tell them, the first year of Artaxerxes as king was 464 BC. 464 BC. And if you go seven years in the future, in the future BC, you count down. As you go in the future, you come to 457 BC. What year is that, my friends? 457 B.C. Put that beside verse 7 of Ezra 7, 457 B.C. Get to the screen. This is a simple historic record. In Nehemiah 2, verse 1, we have another Artaxerxes. We may safely identify him with Artaxerxes Longimanus, the son of Xerxes, who reigned from what year to what year? From 464 to 425 BC. Now pause right there. In your Bible study group, you may have people who may run to Google and type in Artaxerxes, his first year. And let me tell you something. Let me warn you of something here. You will find multiple different multiple years, different years for the first year of Artaxerxes. And your Bible study contact may find themselves confused. Which year are we going to use? Must we, 
who belong to the Baptist church, the Catholic church, no church. Must we just take the words of Seventh-day Adventists and say 464, the starting year for the reign of Artaxerxes, his seventh year, 457 BC? What confirms this? That's where we're going this evening. Since the devil has muddied the water on Google, even in some historic books, historical records, how do we confirm this? That's our journey for this evening. Now, watch the screen carefully. Don't miss it. I'm going to give you the truth, then we shall prove it. Look at the screen. We have far left the year 457 BC autumn. That's the seventh year of the reign of Artaxerxes. Now, the prophecy says 70 prophetic weeks. That's 490 years, as you can see on the screen. That means the 490 years must conclude in the year 34 AD autumn, simply by subtracting 457 from 490. You get 33, you add one, you get 34 AD autumn. How do we confirm that is the question. When we stand before church and state, how do we confirm that as you're giving Bible studies? If you profess to be a Seventh-day Adventist and you can't prove this, how are you going to call people from Babylon into God's remnant movement, into present truth? This just dawned on me. Think about that. I just said, how are we going to call people from Babylon into God's present truth, God's remnant movement, Seventh-day Adventism, if we don't know how to articulate and proclaim the 2300 prophetic days? It's interesting. Where were the Jews when Artaxerxes gave this decree? Where were they? In Babylon. Scattered in Babylon. Cyrus. Darius, Artaxerxes, was now ruling over the kingdom of Babylon. So they were to leave Babylon to return where? To Jerusalem. And what prophecy brought them from Babylon, literally? Just think about that. What prophecy brought them from Babylon, literally? The 2300 prophetic days and the 70 prophetic weeks. So now, spiritually in the last days, what message must carry people from Babylon? And Anchor them within seven-day Adventism. The same prophecy, 2,300 days and 70 prophetic weeks. If it makes sense, say amen. We're not guessing you now. Let's prove now. How do we confirm 457 B.C. and 34 A.D. autumn, the end of the 70 prophetic weeks? Come with me. Look with me. Daniel chapter 9. Go back there with me. I hope I caught your attention now. Just imagine you, you are preaching before church and state and they challenge you. Why do you use Artaxerxes and not Cyrus, not Darius? Would you be scratching your head? Would you be, um, 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 let me get back to you? You would have embarrassed Jesus and embarrassed yourself. Wake up, my friends. Chapter 9 of Daniel. And they, they challenge you. Why do you say 464 B.C., the starting date? for Artaxerxes when we have different dates and any other date throw off the whole prophecy. Any other date destroys 1844. All right, come to verse 25. Does God have your attention now? Verse 25. Now go to verse 24. Here's the point. You must tell your Bible study contact that verse 24 mentions 70 prophetic weeks, just follow me, which means 490 years, and all these years point to the close of probation. If you miss that, you can never explain this. So what are those 70 prophetic weeks? 490 years? Years of what? Probation. And at the end of these years, what would close? Probation. Upon whom? Daniel's people, the Jewish people. Go to verse 24 now. Do you see how slow I'm going? Verse 24, 70 weeks are determined. Determined upon your people, Daniel, and upon thy holy city, what were they to do? To finish the transgression, make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and what else? And to bring in everlasting righteousness, 
and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. They had 70 prophetic weeks of probation. Here's the next step. Tell your Bible study contact there's only one significant event in the New Testament that shows the close of probation upon the Jewish people. And that event is what? The stoning of Stephen. Look at the screen. What was that event? The stoning of Stephen. Tell them that. Then they're going to prove it. The stoning of Stephen. And what year is on the screen? Bottom right of your screen. 3480 autumn. Let's prove that now. Look with me at Acts. Go to Acts 7 now. Where are we going to? There's no connection between chapter 9 of Daniel and Acts 7 without first letting your Bible study contact and group know the 70 prophetic weeks bring us to the close of probation. You have 70 prophetic weeks to bring an end to sin. Amen. Finish transgression. Finish iniquity. Bring in everlasting righteousness. To, to seal up. What does seal up mean? If I seal up, what, what does seal up mean? To close something. Make sense? To seal up the vision and prophecy. It's a sealing up vision. A closing up vision. So underscore sealing and put closing up. As a loose synonym. Look at chapter 7 of Acts. Do I have your attention still? Go to verse 50, verse 51. Now here's the point before you read this. Tell your Bible study contact that when they were stoning Stephen, that Stephen received a vision. Bible says he looked steadfast into heaven. He looked steadfast into heaven. And who did he see? He saw Jesus doing what? Standing at the right hand of God. Now tell them when Christ went to heaven, he didn't go and stand, stand at the right hand of the Father. No. He went to sit at the right hand of the Father. And sitting means what? Tell them. When Christ sat at the right hand of the Father, it meant what? He, he's interceding. All right? So now when he stands up, it's the opposite. What is it now? Intercession is over the close of probation. Once you say that, it's a nail in a sure place. Isaiah 22 and verse 23. Go to verse 56 now. Are you with me so far? We better know what we believe. It's 2019. Verse 56. And said, so behold, I see the heavens open. Stephen speaking, they're stoning him. No, go to verse 55. And he being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfast into heaven and saw the glory of God and whom? And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Verse 56, he said, behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing where? On the right hand hand of God. All right, verse 57, 58. Now they are stoning him. So now tell your Bible study contact, we must now prove that when Christ went to heaven after his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, he went and he sat where? At the right hand of God. Go to Acts 2 now. That's Acts 8. Go to Acts 2. Now let's movements, please. Please, let's movements. Acts chapter 2, and let's take a look at verse number 32. It says, watch carefully, this Jesus hath God what? Raised up. Whereof we are all witnesses. Verse 33. Let's read that. To, what it says together. Therefore, being where? At the right hand of God exalted. Go to verse 34. Last part. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit weird. Sit thou at my right hand. I'll give you three more scriptures. That's Acts 2, right? Go right down. I won't go there. Write down Hebrews chapter 10. Mark your Bibles with a pencil. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 12. I'll give you a third scripture. Write down Hebrews chapter 1. Friends, if you fail... To be able to declare truth is not my fault. It will be your fault, my friends. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 3. 
Christ sat at the right hand of his Father uh, after his ascension. I'll give you another. All right? I gave you what? Three so far? And what are they? Hebrews 10, 12. Acts 2, right? And what? Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. Go to Romans 8 now. Romans chapter 8 is your key scripture. Where are we going in Romans? Romans chapter 8. The Bible tells us that when Christ is sitting at the right hand, it means he's interceding. Romans chapter 8, look at verse 34. The Bible says, who we see that condemneth. It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Resurrection now, ascension. Where is he now? Who is even here? At the right hand of God, who also does what? Maketh intercession for us. That's it, my friends. So now, so Christ was not seen by Stephen sitting at the right hand of the Father. Where was Christ uh, seen? And what was his position? He was seen standing at the right hand of the Father. Now, tell your Bible study contact, when Christ stands up, it means the door of probation is shut. The hour of probation is over. The close of probation has now taken place. And the first scripture, Luke chapter 13. Where are we going to? Luke chapter 13. Friends, my job is to put spiritual arrows in your quiver. It is your job to appreciate. Go back and study and begin to shear. And the more you shear, the more these scriptures stick in your mind. The Holy Spirit cannot bring back what was never there. Luke chapter 13. Even though God can work a miracle because God's word spake, it was done. He commanded and things stood fast. He called things into being that were never in, in existence. God can work a miracle, but he will choose not to do so. We must do our part, what do you say? All right, Luke chapter 13, go to verse 25. And what are we looking for? When Christ stands, what does that mean? The close of probation, verse 25. When, once the master of the house, what are the next three words? What does that mean? Risen up. Come on, is risen up means what? He stands up. All right. When the master of the house is risen up and hath what now? Shut the door. There it is. So when Christ stands up, what happens? The door is shut, my friends. So what happened when they stoned Stephen in Acts 7 and Christ was seen standing? The door of probation was shut on the Jews. Does that make sense? And that is the scripture that shows the end of the 70 prophetic weeks, the 490 years of Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, verse 25. Later on, I'll prove the date. Come back to Luke 13. All right. Verse 23, verse 25, verse 25, when Christ stands up, the door is shut. You shall begin to stand without and to knock at the door saying, what, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And what shall he say? I know you not whence you are. Do you see it, friends? Must I read more of this? I'm going to give you the reference. And you read this scripture and say, dear God, help me not to be found on the outside. When that door is shut, but to be found shut in with you, just as Noah, his wife, three sons, and their three wives were found inside the ark when what was shut? When what was shut? When the door of salvation was forever shut, my friends. Beloved, we are told in the Desire of Ages, page 636, Perilous times are before us, my friends. Men are still buying and selling, planting and building, marrying and giving in marriage. Pleasure lovers are frequenting horse races, gambling hells. Every excitement prevails. While probation's hour is fast closing and each case is about to be decided. Satan knows his time is short. What is he doing? 
He has put all his agencies in place that men might be occupied, deluded, deceived, entranced until the door of probation shall be forever shut and the hour of probation shall be forever ended. <laughs> the door will one day shut, my friends. Do you want to be fun on the outside or on the inside? The desire of ages. Page 635 says, when the student is busily seeking knowledge of everything but their Bibles, probation closes. Christ comes as a thief. All right. Close Luke 13. You know what? Hold Luke 13. Luke 13, I'll give you four scriptures. And give these to your Bible study contact, your Bible study group, but do not underestimate Luke 13. It's the most potent of all the five scriptures. I'll give you one more. When Christ stands, probation closes. Daniel 12. Where are we going to, friends? Daniel 12, verse 1. Now, with this scripture, your Bible study contact, who is new to the faith and Bible truth, may ask you to define who Michael is. All right? Verse 1. And at that time shall Michael what? Stand up. That's Michael, that's Christ, the great prince, which standeth for whom? The children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was, since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, what happens? What happens when Michael stands up? What happens when Christ stands up? It's time for deliverance. Probation closes. And verse 2 says, you better be found written in the book. Your names must be found written where? In the book, verse 1, verse 2. Why? It's the close of probation. It's time for deliverance. It's time for the second coming of Christ. Third scripture. Ezekiel chapter 9. <laughs> All right, put that down. I won't go there. My time is going. Put down Ezekiel chapter 9 and write down verse 3 through verse 6. Verse 3 through verse 6. The Bible says the glory of God, uh, the glory of God arose from between the two cherubims, two cherubs, and came to the threshold of the house. When the glory of God gets up from between those two cherubims, those two cherubs. The Bible says, Christ now says, seal those who are sighing and crying for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And now destroy those who are unrepentant. So when Christ stands up, what happens? The close of human probation. Does it make sense? May I give you a fourth one now? Do you have one more? James chapter 5. Go there with me. No, put it down. Don't have time. Put down James chapter 5 and put down verse number 9. Bible says, when Christ stands up, when Christ comes to the door, he comes to judge. Not just investigative judgment, but executive judgment. These scriptures show when Christ stands up, the door of mercy is shut. Executive judgment. Does it make sense, my friends? Now, Show your Bible study contact this. We just covered when Christ stands up, the close of probation, right? Give them a second irrefutable point that, Jesus, that Christ, I was going to say Jesus, that Christ prophesied the close of probation, hear me, hear me, will take place, hear me, hear me, for the Jews in his day when they would stone someone, he would send. Did you know that the Bible says that? And bring them now to Matthew 23. Where are we going to? Now, no, you must have three, three scriptures now holding on to. You have Luke 13 holding on to. Acts 7 holding on to. Now go now to the last one, Matthew 23, my friends. This is the second nail in a short place. That shows the stoning of Stephen is a close up. Friends, when you understand this, you are willing to die for this truth. But, but before you die for it, what must you do? Live for it. What do you say? All right, Matthew 23. We better know what, what we believe, my friends. Matthew 23. 
Look at verse 37. Christ knows he's about to be crucified. And in verse 37, he says what? Let's, what, what it says, my friend? Let, let's read that. What it says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. What else? Thou that stonest, underscore that. What happened to Stephen? Stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often? When I, Jesus, have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens on her wings, and you would not allow me. Let's read now verse 38. What happens when they stone God's prophet? What happens now, friends? Behold, what? Your house is left unto you desolate. Now, that one scripture now that shows when they stone that person, Christ would sin, their house would be what? Would be what? Left desolate. May I give you a second one? What scripture is this? Matthew, Matthew 23. Go to Matthew 21. Where are we going to, my friends? Matthew 21. This one is even sharper. It says, when you would stone that messenger, I send unto you the next thing Christ says, I am going to take the vineyard from you and give that vineyard to somebody else. When did the Jews turn to the Gentiles? When? After, officially, the stoning of Stephen, and they stoned Stephen in Acts 7. Acts 8, what chapter of Acts? As it begins when they went to Samaria now. Make sense? Due to persecution. Philip, Ethiopian eunuch, you get the point. Matthew 21, look at verse 33. I'm going to reference verse 33. It's a parable in verse 33. The Jewish nation is in verse 33. Verse 34, Christ is seeking fruit. Go to verse 35. And the husband men, who were the husband men? The Jewish people and leaders took God's servants and what? Beat one and what? Killed another and what? Stoned another. Come on down to verse 40. And the Lord therefore of the vineyard, when he comes, what will he do to those husband men that killed God's son, killed his servants, beat one, stoned the other? Verse 41, they say unto Jesus, prophesying their own doom, God will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out, give out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, the Gentiles, which shall render him the what? The fruits in their season. Now watch the point. Take your concordance now. Your what? Just imagine you stand before Mr. Prime Minister. You stand before Mr. President. You stand before Mr. Pope, Bishop, Cardinal, and you say, now take your Bible, Bible concordance. Look at the word stone, the word stoned, past tense, and find one scripture after Christ's death, burial, resurrection, where somebody was stoned, only one. And the first one is whom? Stephen. <laughs> Just imagine the rage that will be on their faces now because they cannot gainsay. They cannot refute the scriptures. Look up the word stone. The word stone, only one, that's Stephen. And when they stone that messenger, Matthew 23, Matthew 21, behold, your what? You think I'm guessing at this? Your house will what? Be left unto you, how my friends? Desolate, the close of probation. Now, what was that key scripture I told you? Make sure you don't under. But make sure you overemphasize what was that scripture to prove when Christ stands up, it's the close of probation. What was that scripture? Go back there. Close Matthew, Luke 13. Hold your place in Acts 7, Luke 13. I want everybody now to, to watch this. Watch carefully. Did we just show multiple scriptures that prove once, 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 once Christ stands up, that probation would close for the Jews. Did we prove that? All right. And secondly, did we show that when they would stone that messenger 
after Christ's death, burial, resurrection, that their house would be left desolate. Did we prove that? There's one scripture that binds those two points. When Christ stands up and when they stone his messenger, probation would close. Luke 13. Watch this now. Go to verse 25. When you have these keys, you will never leave the Seventh-day Adventist church and become a Baptist, become a Catholic, a professed atheist. No, this is, this is a sure foundation. Luke 13, 25, are we there? When once the master of the house is what? Come on, is what? Is that Christ standing up? All right, what happens next? The door will be what? Shut. Watch this now. Skip on down to verse 34. Are we there in verse 34? Verse 34 says what now? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killeth the prophets and what? <laughs> the one scripture that mentions Christ standing up and them stoning his, his servant. Go to verse 35 of Luke 13. Let's all read what, what it says. Behold, your house is what, my friends, is left unto you desolate. That's the scripture. So now, if you want a shortcut, just read Luke 13. Now, then you can add by giving the other scriptures. If that's clear, say amen. It's everyone together now. Then now, you turn to your Bible study group, your contact, and now you say, look, let's prove now the actual date Stephen was martyred. And once we prove that date, all we must do is go backward in time, 70 prophetic weeks, or 490 years, and now you get the starting date for the 2,300 days prophecy and the 70 prophetic weeks. Now, what date was Stephen martyred? What date? You come to the history books. Get to the screen, my friends. Now notice, it says here, <laughs> look at the source I'm quoting from. Look at the source I'm quoting from. Look at, look at the right column of your screen. December 26th, watch carefully, the Universal Church commemorates the death of Stephen in what year? In 34 AD. What's that year, my friends? 34 AD. Now, that was from the Catholic press. Now, do we have a second witness? A second witness, BBC News. The history record, BBC this is in the year 2011. It says, watch carefully, at the, at the Supreme Court, pardon me, the Supreme Jewish Law Court, the Sanhedrin, Stephen recounted the many mercies that God had given to the children of Israel. Next sentence, he accused the Jews of murdering Jesus. Watch carefully. Next phrase, this angered the Sanhedrin Court, Jewish people, last sentence, watch carefully. It was believed Stephen died what year? Around 34 AD, the common era. 34 CE, 34 AD. Is that point clear, my friends? So get to my chart. Look at my chart. So what year was Stephen Stone? 34 AD. So now go back with me now to Daniel chapter 9. So once you confirm 34 AD, let's go back now, bring your Bibles to the group to Daniel 9. And then you show them how many years would go to the close of probation for the Jewish people. 490 years. The stoning of Stephen, verse 24, verse 25. Is that point clear? Is that point clear so far? So now 34 AD, go back. 490, what do you get? Subtract 490 or subtract 34 from 490. What do you get? 33. But you're crossing from BC to AD, you must add one. So what is that? What is that, my friends? Well, come on, what is that? If you subtract 34 from 490, you get 456. But you're going from BC to 80 or, make sense now, must add one. So what's that one plus four, five, six? 
457 BC. That's it there, my friends. So now you go to Google, some history books, and they confuse you. What year was the seventh year of Artaxerxes? Now you know it's what year? 457 BC. That means 464. His first year is confirmed. It's a nail in a sure place, my friends. Does that make sense? Now, now you can stand for the truth of God. Just have you ever find yourself giving instruction but didn't really have certainty of the instruction? <laughs> you, you don't want that feeling in these last days. Giving a Bible study and or standing before church and state preaching for your life. And for the salvation of churchmen, statesmen, and onlookers, you want certainty, Proverbs 22. Go there with me. Where are we going to, my friends? We want certainty, Proverbs 22, verse 20, and verse 21, that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth. So what happened now in 1844? The ending of 2300 years. What happened there, my friends? The close of what? Come on. The closing of the holy place and the opening of what? The most holy place. The work of investigative judgment began. Is that certain? Is that certain, my friends? So what time are we now living in? Since October 22nd, 1844. What time are we now living in? So now watch. Now, if your Bible study class can handle a few more points, bring them back to Ezra chapter 6. Where are we going to now, friends? Now, here is where you want to connect, watch carefully, connect the rebuilding of Jerusalem with the three angels' messages. How many kings gave that one decree? How many kings? Their names. Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes. Now, how many angels gave one everlasting gospel? Three. Do you see it, my friends? Three angels gave one everlasting gospel. So notice now, watch carefully now. What says the second angel? Babylon is falling. Chapter 14, verse 8 of the Revelation. Then show your Bible study contact. Chapter 18 of the Revelation, which says, Come out of her, my people. Come out from where? From Babylon. All right. Does that make sense? Friends, does that make sense? Now talk to me. When Ezra, Nehemiah, receive the decree to go and rebuild Jerusalem, where were they coming from? Babylon. Go to Ezra with me. Where are we going to, my friends? Ezra, now remember, every study, you must end with self-examination. So we just covered the doctrine. Let's deal with self-examination now. Where are we going to, my friends? Ezra chapter 6. Let's talk about self-examination. As they were called to rebuild Jerusalem, amen, as they were called to leave Babylon, lead your Bible so the contact to leave the sins of Babylon, amen, and to rebuild what temple? Their body temple. Does that make sense, my friends? All right. Go to verse number 7. No, go to verse 6. Ezra 7, verse 6. It says, this Ezra, went up from where? Come on, talk to me. From where? So where was he coming from? Babylon. And what says that second angel message? Come on from Babylon. Amen, my friends. Does it make sense now? Yes. Now watch. Show your Bible study contact the character of Ezra and why God chose to use Ezra because his characteristic trait must be ours. Does that make sense now? Look at verse number six. Now, how was Ezra described? Verse six, this Ezra went up from Babylon. He was what? What two words? He was already, on a score ready, he was already and he was a scribe. A ready scribe in the law of Moses. Hmm. What, what do scribes do? 
Huh? What do scribes do? They write. Amen? And writing is a form of proclaiming the gospel. So who was Ezra? Hmm? A ready writer and preacher of the gospel. I'm going to prove that to you. Does, does, does a scribe use a pen? Does a scribe use a pen? Psalm 45, verse 1 says, My heart, my mind, is indicting a good matter. Watch carefully now. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. My tongue is what, my friends? My tongue is like the pen of a ready, keyword, a ready writer. So who was Ezra? <laughs> Psalm 45, verse 1. My tongue is as the pen of a ready or a ready scribe, writer, a scribe. So now Ezra was used by God because he was willing to leave Babylon. What about you, my friends? Ezra was used. Why? Because he was a ready scribe. What text comes to mind about ready? To preach God's word in the last days. What now? Go to that scripture. Put it down, 1 Peter chapter 3. Look at verse 15. Don't forget to show self-examination. 1 Peter chapter 3. Let's order read this, but do what? Verse 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be what? Underscore ready. And be with how often? Always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with what, my friends? With meekness and fear. Does that make sense? Be ready. Now, what must we do daily to be ready to give a word in due season? What must we have daily in order to be able to give a word in due season to those who are weary? What must we have daily, my friends? That's it. We must have daily devotion. We must be ready. Not only ready, watch carefully. Tell your Bible study contact. Don't just think a mere intellectual knowledge is going to save you. Yes, be ready to proclaim God's word. But you must know it. But make sure the very word you proclaim is what you are living. Go with me. Bring them to chapter 19, Revelation. Where are we going to, my friends? Revelation 19. And look with me at verse number 7. You know, we're told in volume 4, page 194, many have taken hold of the truth, but the truth has not taken hold of their hearts to transform their lives. That's it. The truth has not taken hold of them to transform their hearts. But yet they, have, they are holding the word of God. The truth must convert you. Look at this. Verse 7. Are we there, my friends? We must be ready. Chapter 19. Look at verse 7. If you're there, just say amen. God's word says, verse 7. Let us be glad and what? Rejoice and give honor to him. Why? The marriage of the lamb is come and whom? His wife hath made herself ready. So what must we get ready for? Talk to me. So show your Bible study contact. They must get ready for this marriage supper. What's the marriage? The two becoming one. Which two must become one? Christ. And us individually must become one. But what separates us from Christ? Sin. So to be ready, what must we get victory over, my friends? Sin. Can we get victory? Is this victory a gift? Look at verse 8. It's a gift. Verse 8. And to her, and put your name there, and to Andrew, put your name there, and to save to serve was granted. What's granted? It's a gift that she, put your name there, that Andrew should be arrayed in what? In fine linen, clean and white. Why? 
For the fine linen is what? Is the righteousness of saints. It's a gift. Question. Question. Is there a condition to receive this gift? Think now. Is there a condition that we must meet in order for Christ to declare us and cover us with his righteousness? What says 1 John chapter 1 verse 9? What is that condition? If we what? Come on. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and what? And to cleanse us of how many? How much? Of all unrighteousness. How then will he declare us? Righteous. We must be ready to surrender when? Surrender now. Go back with me to Ezra. Ezra chapter 7. Look at Ezra's character. His experience must be ours. Go to verse 9. Notice, when did Ezra leave Babylon? When? Verse 9. For upon the what day? Talk to me. Verse 9. It says, for upon the first day of what month? The first month began Ezra to leave Babylon. So what would you say to your Bible study contact? What is God saying to us right now? Since he left Babylon the first day of the first month. What is God saying to us, my friends? Come on, talk to me. What now? It's a new year, my friends. Amen? Get to the screen. Although, in one sense, the first day of the new year is no more to God than any other day, yet God often puts into the hearts of his children at that time, first day of the new year, a desire to begin the new year with new results. Perhaps, what results? Perhaps with plans to carry out some worthy enterprise and with purposes to what? Talk to me. To depart from the wrongs of the old year. Leave Babylon sins and to live the new year with new determinations. Next paragraph. In God's plan for his ancient people, he gave the command on the first day of the first month, shalt thou set up the tabernacle. Next sentence. We today, January 17th, 2019, we today have no tabernacle to set up as had the children of Israel. But we have a work of building to do. What is that building? The importance of which all need to understand. Last sentence, let's read that. Let us remember that what? Character, that's the building. That's the temple. That character is not the result of accident, but what? But day by day, it is forming for good or for evil. So what tabernacle are we to begin to erect, my friends? Come back to Ezra 7. This is what we must do. Examine ourselves. Now, I'm going to close with, the, with these two last points. Show your Bible study contact that Ezra had a similar experience as the Jesus. That's the first. I'll give you the latter afterward. Come to Ezra, Ezra 7. And his experience must be ours. Look at verse 10. Verse 10. For Ezra had prepared his heart to do what? To seek the law of the Lord. And what else? And to do it. And what else? And to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. So what was Ezra's attitude? His desire? That must be ours. First, first one, verse 10. What? He prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. What comes to mind? Do you agree? Psalm 1? Psalm 1 comes to mind? All right. Next point. It says, and to do the law. What says Psalm 40? Psalm 40, verse 8. What did Christ say in Psalm 40, verse 8? I delight to do thy will, O my God, O my God. Yea, thy law is here within my heart. Pause. Did Ezra have a similar experience as did Jesus 
Yes. So what must be our experience? Yes, my friends. Does it make sense? I'm not hearing all of you. Does it make sense, my friends? Amen? May I share one more thing? May I? May I? And Psalm 40, verse 8, verse 10 says, I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy righteousness before the great congregation. And these are the same words in Ezra 7, verse 10. Prepare his heart to seek God's law, to obey God's law, and to teach God's law. Do you see it, my friends? Does it make sense? My last point. Who did they stone? <laughs> Look at this. Ezra lived, lived in the time of 457 BC, right? Watch this. And Ezra had the experience of Jesus. Fast forward 490 years. You come to whom? Stephen, the martyr, who they stoned. Does Stephen have the experience of Christ? What did Stephen say in Acts 7 when they stoned him? Father, forgive them. Lay not this sin to their charge. And what did Jesus say in Luke 23 and verse 34? Father, forgive them. Why? For they know not what they do that, oh, that Stephen have the experience of Christ. The beginning of the 70 prophetic weeks, Ezra had the experience of Christ. The end of the 70 prophetic weeks, 490 years, Stephen had the experience of Christ. Question, did Stephen learn to forgive those who were persecuting him in AD 34 when he was being stoned? Or did Stephen have to learn this before he was stoned? When? So when must we learn to forgive even those who persecute us and gossip uh, and malice us? When? It's now. So must we drink that bitter cup now, my friends? Does it make sense? Does it make sense? When must we be like Christ? Hear me. As I close, some people say, if we try to live and become holy to overcome sin, they say that is legalism, that's fanaticism, <laughs> right? But Matthew 5 verse 48 says, Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect as God is perfect in his sphere. So we must be perfect in our sphere. Does that make sense? And we're told in volume 2, Testimonies volume 2, page 628, we can never, we can never, she says, we can never equal the example. We can never equal the example, but we must surely copy the example. We can equal Christ, but we better copy him. Does that make sense, my friends? Go to Psalm 40. I'm going to give you a gem I got in my devotion this morning. A hey, what, my friends? So my friends, if we must forgive those who hurt us now, that means God must allow us to go through some, some, some stoning now. What stones will they use? Not literal stones, but what stones? Their words. Go to Psalm 4. Their words. Do you remember? Look at the screen. Do you remember we read in early writings, page 47? What must we all drink? What must we all drink? Must we all drink that bitter cup, my friends? Must we all drink that bitter cup? How may we sweeten that bitter cup? How, my friends? Now, what if we murmur? What if we complain? What happens to that bitter trial? What happens? It becomes more bitter. So how may we sweeten that bitter cup? How, my friends? How? By what? By putting pep in our steps. With a song, the first piece, what? Patience. The second one, endurance. The third, it's prayer. And we're told, it's all, it's all, all on the screen. Ministry of Healing, page 254. Song is a weapon. 
that we can always use against discouragement. Go to Psalm 40. Here is the nugget God gave to me. In Psalm 40, verse 1 and ver verse 1 through verse 3, you found the pep in your step with a song. Go to verse 1. What's the first P in the acronym PEP? What's in verse 1? Patience. Verse 1, Psalm 40. I waited how? Patiently. That's the first P. Notice now. Let's find prayer. Verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord. Next phrase. And what now? And he inclined unto me and heard my cry. What's that cry? It's prayer. Patience. The first P. Prayer, the last speed. What about E? Pep in the step. Go to verse 2. Show me endurance. Verse 2. He brought me up also out of the horrible pit. Do you see endurance there? If you can be brought out of something unless you were first. Oh, my friends. Do you see it? Pep. Do you see it, my friends? Patience. Endurance. Prayer. So where's the song? Where is song? Verse 3. Verse 3. And he hath put a what? A new song in my mouth, my friends. The pep in your step. Early writings, page 40, 47. With a song, minister of healing, page 254. Let me tell you something. Duane, volume. Let me tell you something, friends. We are heading to a time where all of us will have to drink off that bitter cup. Christ drank from it. We must drink from it. We better understand now how to put some pep in our steps and how to be able to say the words of volume 5, page 147, which says, which says, death. Come on if you know it. Oh, my friends, death before dishonor or the transgression of God's law should be the motto of Every Christian, death before dishonor. That's our motto. But you won't learn that in the future. In a crisis, we must now learn it. Volume 5, page 135. Let none of us think that a self-sacrificing patriotic spirit will be developed in a moment because it is needed. Oh no! Daily these things must be brought into our experience and be given to our children by precept and example. It's now, not then. Look at the bitter cup that's coming when the Sunday law is enforced. How close are we? Look with me at chapter 13, Revelation. Where are we going to, my friends? Here's how I know the bitter cup is near, friends. And it's going to get even bitter. We haven't, we haven't, tasted anything yet we are told that the Sunday law will be enforced when that deadly wound is healed and once the deadly wound of the papacy is healed it says all the world will follow will wonder will wander after the beast friends if you are a leader who are behind you followers followers and I want everyone to notice in this clip you're going to see. You will see how Pope Francis has garnered the attention and the allegiance, the honor of princes, rulers, merchants, the bankers, as well as Congress, lawmakers. This is a trailer that came out January 10th, 2019. Headline, leadership. Key word, my friend, a key title. And Pope Francis. Notice. Eric Schmidt, CEO of Google. Donald Trump, President of the Google. United States. Tech company. Vladimir Putin, President of Russia. Communism. Leonardo DiCaprio, Hollywood movie star. Mm. Christine Lagarde, Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund. Elizabeth II, Queen of England. Why do authorities from around the world want to meet with Pope Francis? Why do Obama and Raul Castro credit Pope Francis' contribution to the reopening of their positive relationship? How is leadership generated? What are the keys to strengthen prestige? 
la gente tiene como una esa imagen. People have an image of the Vatican as being so ceremonious and charged. However, when the Pope comes with a smile, with such wonderful humility, and always with such simple words, it really surprises people. Se sorprende. The possibility of slipping up is always there. It is always around the corner. The one who does not accept the concept of risk cannot do this work. But at the end of the tunnel there is a light, which is the light of hope. We believe in that light. That light leads us. I think Pope Francis has emerged as a very credible, credible. man, and a very credible leader. He seems to follow through with what he says. Mm. So we don't have leaders who could just, you know, say, it's not about me, it's about the institution I represent. Uh, it's about the country I represent. It's not sort of like this authoritar authoritative, um, you know, condemning condemnation. He said he, ex he accepts the failings of human, okay. that we are human and we fall down. You get the point. I want to ask a question, friends. Who were these people in this trailer? Who were they? You have leaders in, in, in the tech companies, right? You saw that? You have Hollywood stars, right? Musicians, right? You had who else? Politicians, right? Communists, Islam, papists, all following whose lead? So whose wound is now being healed? Is a Sunderland near? Is that bitter cup near to get more bitter? We better put some pep in our steps, my friends. And, and literally speaking, put some pep in our step with the song to find ourselves in the right spiritual condition, in the right spiritual, physical, physical location. Notice here, my friends, what this man is calling for. It says, headline, it says, Pope Francis, who is he advocating for? Islam, right? Skip on down. He's calling Islam a religion of peace. Red words. Red words says, just as Pope Francis seems to favor a one world government, he also seems to be drawn by the vision of a what? A one world religion. The world is telling us this. We are nearing this. And we should be the ones proclaiming this, warning people, it's time to get ready. Let's expose the man of sin. That's why the book, Great Controversy, this book right here, my friends, is needed. It says, one way, this is how I know Sister White is inspired. She's, this says, red words, one way to achieve a one world religion, one way to achieve this unity in diversity is by what? De-emphasizing doctrine. Write down Great Controversy, page 444. JC 444. It, 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 it's the same principle. Last sentence. Last sentence. It says, just as Francis disapproves of borders between nations, it's quite likely that Pope Francis looks upon borders between religions as artificial and unnecessarily divisive. Second sentence, second sentence, doctrinal differences are, after all, the main dividing line between what? Different religions. Let's remove, the, let's de-emphasize doctrine. So what's happening within Seventh-day Adventism when we hear a cry to de-emphasize doctrines? How dare we do that, my friends? Notice how I'm certain, my friends, that this, again, put this down, GC444, that a Sunday law is near, the cup is about to get bitter, put some pep in our steps. This past Sabbath evening, we spoke about Columbus, right? The Knights of Columbus, right? Amen. The Spanish Inquisition, right? How many ships did he have? Columbus. Three, what were they? The Pinta, the Nina Nina, <laughs> Nina, Nina, the Pinta Nina or Nina, and Santa Maria. Now notice, past that, let's come to this day in history. Francis the first of France. I'm going to share this with you, my friends. Notice here, this is going to really startle you. January 15th, and today is January 17th, two days ago. 
On the 15th of January, 1541, King Francis I of France gave Jean-Francois Roberval, Roberval a commission, watch this, to settle the province of New France, that was Canada, was called New France, and provide for what? The spread of the Holy Catholic faith. And they gave him also three ships to do that. Now you see why Alexander Hamilton, does it make sense now? In 1774, we covered this this past Sabbath evening, where he says that the Quebec Act was giving a, 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 a refuge to Protestants' greatest enemies, who were the Jesuits. Makes sense now, my friends. When I saw that January 15th, regarding Mr. Francis I of France, who was literally pushing and spreading the Roman Catholic faith worldwide, I did a, a quick research. And I came to E.J. Wagner, one of our, I guess, uh, pioneers of Seventh-day Adventists. And E.J. Wagner is quoting from renowned church historian J.A. Wiley. Listen to what J.A. Wiley said about Francis I and then what E.J. Wagner said about the application. As a matter of fact, there, was there has never been any open persecution by the Roman Catholic Church for the violation of civil laws. Why? Because the Roman Catholic Church as a church has never of itself had the power to persecute openly. The Catholic dogmas were incorporated into the laws of civil governments, of her priests or her priests were clothed with civil power. Then, when those who in the church declared heretics were put to death, watch this, friends, hear this. When those, the Roman Catholic Church declared heretics, were put to death, watch this. It was not for their religion, but because they had violated civil laws and were dangerous to the peace and welfare of the state. Francis I of France was a bitter persecutor of so-called heretics. Many scaffolds had been set up in Paris and Francis I had pledged himself to extirpate Lutheranism, Protestantism from his dominions. Next paragraph, but when the Protestant princes of Germany, with whom Francis I wished to make an alliance, asked an explanation for his proceedings, Francis I was ready with his excuse. And his excuse was that of almost all persecutors of every age. He said, the king said, had not been, the king had not been burning Lutherans, but executing traitors, he said. If those who had been put to death had imbibed reform sentiments, it was not for their religion, but for their sedition. They had been punished. In other words, in other words, he said, we burn and kill those Lutherans, those Protestants. Why? Because they rebelled against civil laws. Wait a minute. But whose laws were brought into the civil government, the Roman Catholic Church's laws. Here comes now E.J. Wagner. Last two lines. He says, in like manner, one of the judges in the case of Brother Holster, in the 1890s said that he was not convicted. Brother Hoser, Hoser, Brother Hoser was not convicted because he was an Adventist. But because he had transgressed the Sunday law. 
Here comes E.J. Wagner now. But the son of the law is directly contrary to the Bible, which Brother Hoser, as a Seventh-day Adventist, could not disregard. That means today in 2019, when the son of the law is passed, months from now, when God allows it to be enforced, they will say, we are not persecuting you because you honor Sabbath, but because you won't honor Sunday and you're breaking Sunday. That's the deception, which is the same thing. Do you see it now, friends? On the, on the heels of this, look what came out in the news. Headline, hotel dishwasher awarded 21 million after her boss made her work on Sundays. So what day of worship is now being protected by the civil government? What day of worship, so-called, is now being protected by the civil government Sunday? My question is, based on prophecy, what's going to happen when Seventh-day Adventists say, we want to be able to honor the Sabbath and not keep Sunday? Will we be afforded the same privilege? Based on prophecy, the answer is no. Chapter 13 of the Revelation. You could read that. Watch this. Headline says, Exhorting a False Sabbath. Volume. dishwasher awarded a big settlement after she sued the owners of the hotel where she works arguing religious discrimination. The jury siding with her in the tune of more than $21 million. But will she get that much? NBC6 reporter Amanda Placencia is live right now at the woman's church. And Amanda, you spoke to her. Yes, that's right, Joanne. I spoke to that woman, that dishwasher, Marie Pierre, and she says that she was a devoted employee of Hilton Hotels, but she says that it was her devotion to God, praying here at the Bethel Baptist Church, that she says got her fired, but now she's since fought that termination. Marie John Pierre was a dishwasher at the Conrad Miami for almost 10 years, but she suddenly found herself without a job. I love God. No, I can do Sunday because uh, Sunday, mm. I honor God. The devout Christian missionary who was born in Haiti says that she missed six Sundays from work for religious purposes. But then she says her boss at the hotel, which was then managed by Hilton, fired her. They accommodated her for seven years, and Listen. they easily could have accommodated her, but instead of doing that, they set her up for absenteeism and threw her out. Attorney Mark Brummer representing Pierre as she sued the hotel chain, a jury in federal court ruling in her favor Monday, granting her $36,000 in back pay, half a million dollars for pain and suffering, and $21 million in punitive damages, of which she can collect $300,000. She's a soldier of Christ. She was doing this for the, all the other people, all the other workers who are being discriminated against. But as she spoke through a translator, Pierre says she didn't do it for the money. Uh, it's not a lottery. The earth and the skies belong to God. Federal law requires an employer to make reasonable Listen. considerations for religious Federal practices. Law. Brummer says he hopes his verdict sets a standard. But this was not about money. This was about sending a message to other corporations, whether big or small, whatever size you are. If you're going to take the blood and sweat of your workers, you better accommodate them or let them at least believe in their religious beliefs. Not a preference, but a belief. Mm. A jury has awarded a Miami hotel dishwasher $21.5 million now you get the point, right? after concluding now that her employer this. failed to honor her religious beliefs by repeatedly scheduling her on Sundays and ultimately firing her. In 2017, mm. Marie Jean Pierre, a dishwasher at the Conrad Miami, sued park hotels and resorts for violations of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Pierre is a member of the Soldiers of Christ Church, a Catholic missionary group that helps the poor. Catholic. And she said she needed Sundays off from Catholic. work. In 2016, she was fired for alleged misconduct, negligence, and unexcused absences. But what about the Adventists? Why were the Adventists in many instances, not offered the same privilege. Hmm? Why? Why? Why, my friends? Notice here, 
And on what basis did she win? Federal law, the Civil Rights Act. So the question is, are we going to be able as Seventh-day Adventists, when, let's get to the screen as I speak, are we going to be able as Seventh-day Adventists to say we can find shelter under the Civil Rights Act of 1964? Hmm? Would that be our umbrella of safety? No, my friends. The Bible tells us our freedoms are going to be repudiated. Repudiated. And notice, look at the juxtaposition. Did they force and compel her to work on Sunday? What's going to happen to Seventh-day Adventists when the Sunday law is enforced? We are going to be forced to work on the Sabbath. <laughs> what now? There's no compensation. Look, look at this, my friend. There's so much more I could say on this. But you get the point. What about the other Adventists? I'm going to scan through this. I'm going somewhere. What about other Adventists? Why is it that their preference is given? I'm telling you, friends, we're nearing home. Even in Jamaica, Sabbath agony. <laughs> you get the point. It's right there. Won't spend much time there, friends. Won't spend much time there. Listen to what we're told now. In uh, Southern Work, page 69, second paragraph, the time will come when men will not only forbid uh, Sunday work, but what? They will try to force God's people to labor on the Sabbath. It's coming. And men will be asked to renounce the Sabbath and subscribe to Sunday observance or forfeit their what? Freedom and their lives. So we come back to Francis the first of friends. And they will say, we're not persecuting you, persecuting you because you, you are a Seventh-day Adventist, but because you don't honor Sunday the way how we say you must honor it, and because you refuse to work on Sabbath. Do you know right now in many ordinances in various cities, if you are a, a, a contractor, there is a certain guideline wherein contractors cannot work on Sundays nor have their, their, their workers work on Sunday. It is a city ordinance in many states. Already Sunday has already been espoused by civil governments. And that's why I read what E.J. Wagner wrote from J.A. Wiley and Francis the First of Friends. They're going to persecute us and say, well, it's because you're breaking Civil law. And that's how, that was the argument that crucified Christ. This man is a perverter of the nation. He's breaking the civil law. Why? He's telling people not to give tribute unto Caesar. He's a ringleader. He is a seditionist. Last quote, and we're out of here. Desire of Ages, page 121. Let's all read a third quotation. What it says. In the last great conflict of the controversy with Satan, those who are loyal to God will see what? Every. What's every? Does that include your job? Does that include your home? What's every mean? Every earthly support cut off. Does that mean your rights? Does that mean the Civil Rights Act? Oh, my friend. We'll see every earth is support cut off. Why? Because they refuse to break God's law in obedience to earthly powers. They will be forbidden to buy or sell. It will finally be decreed like Jesus, like Stephen. What? Like Stephen. What? They must be stoned. They must be put to death. So when must we put pep in our step with a song? Oh, my friends, kneel with me. Father in heaven, we thank you for your words tonight. Prepare us for this coming communion service, the day of fasting and prayer this coming Sabbath, January, what's that, 19th. Father, please, 
the words we have heard tonight, let them sink deep in our souls and be a good fruit to your glory. Give us urgency to awaken the world, even as we see this coming Sunday and Monday, this so-called super wolf blood moon. Let us take this opportunity to evangelize those around us with the ebook on the same point, with the book Great Controversy, the chapter Heralds of the Morning. Help us to do all that we can now to sow and water gospel seeds before it's too late. Save us, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.